Hi everybody, Adrian Fuentes is here. Did you know that the Democrats of Greater Tucson has a website, thedgt.org, and if you subscribe, it's only 20 bucks, you can support this great weekly communication where folks get together, sometimes there's candidates, sometimes folks like me pop on uh, to help understand what's going on in the world. The Democrats of Greater Tucson, thedgt.org, uh, join up today. Hello, and thank you for joining us at this uh, evening DGT Salon. We are here with uh, Sarah Benatar, who is the uh, Coconino County Assessor. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you. Treasurer. Oh, sorry, treasurer. No, yeah. you're fine. You're fine. I don't I don't really want to be the assessor. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, Francis Sawyer, who is the, the founder and director of uh, Pleiades Strategies, who, uh, well, you can, you can talk a little bit about Pleiades and what it is that Pleiades Strategies does, please, Sarah Francis. Hi. Hello. It's great to be with everybody. So Pleiades Strategy, we work on uh, policy and campaigns that are supporting an equitable clean energy transition and uh, and fair economy that works for everybody. So have been deeply tracking at the national level uh, many of the trends that we're going to talk about tonight. Excellent. Great. Thanks for joining us. And the, the topic for this evening is, of course, DEI, uh, especially here in Arizona. But, you know, what it is, uh, you know, what organizations use uh, the organizational principles of DEI in order to accomplish in their organizations uh, and the, the kind of attacks that has been coming under here nationally and here in Arizona. So uh, to kick off the the uh, the introduction here. Uh, Sarah, if you want to say a little bit about yourself, maybe uh, five minutes a piece uh, for uh, Sarah and Francis to introduce themselves, give their bona fides, uh, their their uh, their professional expertise in this area, uh, and then we'll uh, dive into the uh, subject itself. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mike, for having us. It's good to see everyone. I am the Coconino County Treasurer. I've served in this role for almost 10 years now. It seems like a long time. Um, and, you know, a big piece of what we do as treasurers is we are the chief investment officer for the county and the various taxing districts. We are also your bank, um, again, for taxing districts and the county. And of course, what most people know us for is we collect our property taxes. Um, but that truly is um, a piece of the office. You know, a lot of the banking and the investment side is very important to us. And so, with that comes, um, you know, how we manage the investments, the policies that we adopt um, for investment management. Um, and so every county uh, gets to set their investment policies. There's obviously best practices. Um, and then from there, you know, we do our own procurement um, and the likes. And, you know, we, I, I incorporate DEI with the giant trend of anti-ESG, and that falls in that category, because it is one of various pieces, and they really are, um, there's this national trend, and we're seeing it here in Arizona, of just attacking it from all angles. So DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, um, DEI falls, in my view, you know, kind of under the S and even the G um, part of ESG, and so really the last, unfortunately, three years, I have been very, I'm um, spending a lot of my time locally across the state and even nationally, including testifying for Congress on the impacts that um, this anti-movement is having to local governments, which is essentially trying to limit our abilities as to who we can do business with based off of businesses adopting policies like DEI policies, climate policies, just basic good governance policies, and at the same time, limiting our abilities at the local level um, to adopt those policies, whether it's in our procurement process, whether it's in what we are investing in, um, whether we can even have a DEI department, et cetera. So there are a lot of attacks on that. So that has been um, my big focus the last three years. We've seen it and every year it just gets worse. And I will stop right there because that goes into, Francis and I put something together. Um, definitely going to give a lot of kudos to Francis um, on that. So we're super excited to share it, but I will stop right there. All right, over to you, Francis. 
Awesome. Yeah, Sarah, fab introduction to all of the many intertwined topics. And I think that, you know, really listening to you, like what comes across is just the rock star powers that folks who are serving in treasurer positions and in elected positions have over so many of the financial levers that shape our economy, shape, um, you know, the life and lifestyle that we're able to have and what economic fairness means um, and good policy means. And so the um, attacks that have been really rising to the surface across all of this, this is what we've been studying and watching. Um, and as you mentioned, I think, you know, they really hone in on the deep power that um, that financial management responsibility has in um, shaping so many things in our lives. Yeah. Um, with that, so, I've got... So uh, in terms of uh, what we're focusing on right here with with Sarah is, of course, the, the management of, of public trust mon monies. But in terms of DEI across, uh, across interdisciplinary uh, areas. This also uh, relates to to corporate management, banking, finance uh, across the board. Correct. Yes, yes, across the board. So it's everything from incorporating, and so the attacks are, um, you know, the the GOP is anti um, DEI, um, anti ESG, and so they are since they can't tell companies what to do, they are actually um, essentially introducing legislation to say governments will not do business with any company who has these policies. And so companies have these policies um, in their daily work. They also adopt them on um, various risk factors as well. So they're across the spectrum um, in all types of companies, whether it's financial, whether it's transportation, whether it's, you know, goods manufacturing, it is across the board, all Corporate over governance the place. in general uh, is under attack. Fully embedded, yeah. Yeah. So yes. uh, Francis, uh, uh, Sarah mentioned that you guys had work been working on a project together. Would you like to describe that that project that you've been working on? Um, yeah, would love that. And is it possible to share a screen? Any it is. Oh, I forgot to make you a co-host. Let me Great. go ahead and do that right now. Um, yeah, we pulled together some slides to kind of walk okay. through all of the ways that corporate governance is being hit right now and how that gets back to these, you know, fundamental accountability practices and risk management tools that had been ascended in like the voluntary um, private markets and started to get the attention of uh, right wing uh, extremists and Republicans as something that was really shaping the way that capital was um, moving. So. So, so let me clarify that DEI and ESG as philosophies to approach uh, corporate governance and in financial management are, are, are voluntary. They're not being forced <clears throat> on anybody. Uh, what's being forced is for those corporations and organizations who are using these as tools to better their operations are being attacked for their free speech. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's your screen that I'm seeing there, Sarah? Oh, no. That's uh, it's separate. Francis. Yep. Okay, great. All but right. Yeah. So, so like to that exact point, um, if we think about... Uh, the economy. Um, we are situated in it. We live it. We breathe it. It impacts so much about where we work, um, what type of opportunities our kids have, what we can shop for at the market, what you know, who who gets served, which goods, and what is available. And we all live and swim within this economy. And there's key stakeholders that are, you know, core to a company uh, success in the business world. You've got investors um, who are going to be investing capital in that company. You have the company's management and their employees. And so the folks who want to go work for that company. And then you've got the customers who are selling goods. And so as we look at what has um, really been an active conversation in the corporate space for, I think, the history of capitalism, but particularly in the last number of years, is that there has been a call by those key stakeholders for companies, so the employees, the workforce talent that they're looking to hire, the investors, uh, and customers, that companies um, 
have in place good practices on environmental, social, and governance issues. And ESG has become the latest shorthand kind of in this suite of corporate responsibility and corporate accountability tools. And what we've seen in the last um, number of years is that there has been across these categories a um, movement of companies being called to take and taking uh, public positions and moving their um, business practices towards answering the call by those key stakeholders who they want to keep doing business with. And so this has included things like the incorporation of climate and environmental action. So think like commitments to net zero, uh, clean energy commitments, um, commitments to uh, stopping deforestation, supply chain commitments, environmental action um, that is voluntary. You have programs in diversity, equity, inclusion that's really recognizing that the workplace and consumer base is diversifying and that companies should be um, working to navigate and welcome that diversification and creating pathways into uh, employment, into team belonging and inclusion, into um, leadership positions um, from a more diverse set of uh, constituents than has been the case in the past. Looking at workers' rights and sort of how a company treats its workforce, what are the safety standards, um, what are the pay structures, how um, is labor recognized within a company, and then just basic good governance. You know, I think to the um, Norfolk Southern uh, blast that happened in Palestine. Um, Palestine, Ohio, where a train got derailed and there was a chemical explosion that really significantly put a community in deep danger. Um, that and the governance practices that led to the safety failures, those good governance practices are really, really important. And so across the board on these issues, alongside um, you know, policies that have supported these things coming from the public. You've had a call for private sector voluntary action from companies that has really pulled um, companies into thinking seriously, making public commitments and taking a stand in the public sphere um, on these topics and then building programs uh, within their company to answer that call coming from their stakeholders. That process hasn't been perfect. There's been a lot of announcements and less action compared to the announcements, and it's been controversial um, in many um, cases. And it's been called out. You might have heard, um, you know, calls against like woke capitalism. Um, thinking of, you know, DeSantis um, going up against uh, the Disney company, um, mm -hmm. Budweiser, um, when they were looking at their social media post and highlighting a trans influencer. And these calls, you know, started to get the attention of the right wing and the right wing did not like that corporate America was wading into these really important conversations. And um, that's when we had a backlash um, to this begin. Now, to, other... to, be, to be clear here, Francis, I'd like to, to query this a bit. Um, yeah. When you say calls from stakeholders, car calls from the marketplace, this hasn't been something that that governments have been doing, especially democratically controlled governments have, have been doing, is it? Um, so a lot of this has started as voluntary action, voluntary calls, seeing, um, you know, particularly employees wanting to see their companies um, be welcoming places um, and places that respect them, um, seeing customers wanting to see the same, and investors wanting to have full information about the risk that their uh investment portfolio might face due to the failure to take into account any of the, you know, risk to not um, serving those key constituencies. And so it's really come through voluntary action yeah. Yeah. in parallel so, to that, though. To, to be clear, then, to, to rephrase, if you will, uh, this is not something that is being imposed on market actors. This is something that's arising within free associations within the marketplace who have made who have come to a decision themselves freely and free of government interference or coercion mm -hmm. that they want to adopt these practices that they want corporations to respond to these issues uh, and corporations feeling that it is in their best interest business wise to do this this isn't some marxist plot <laughs> to to force these values on anybody am i right it, it is it is thus far been capitalism responding to their customers, investors, and employees that a company needs on their side to uh, 
move forward and to, to stay in business. There is one um, exception to that, which I think is a really important parallel, which yeah. is that as you've had that voluntary action um, around things like climate-related risk disclosure, so basically a company um, needing to report out where carbon emissions are embedded within their um, operations and a company needing to, you know, say, for example, if they're a real estate company and their real estate portfolio includes a lot of homes that are uh, at sea level in an area with rising seas, that's an investment risk that is going to have a material impact on the portfolio performance of that investment um, in the near and the long term. And there's a lot of climate risk that is embedded within the large retirement portfolios that we all hold, um, the investment portfolios that the um, you know major financial institutions are managing. And that climate risk, starting with this voluntary free association calling on from stakeholders, really, really grew. And the importance of that risk disclosure um, was recognized and was being brought at this moment from the voluntary space into regulation from groups like the Securities Exchange Commission, which last week released its first rule to mandate that companies disclose those material emissions. And so we also, responding to these voluntary calls and the recognition of the real risk that these topics held um, and the importance of it for a company to do well in an investment portfolio, particularly one that is, say, managing retirements, um, a retirement fund where you need to provide the retirement for a teacher who's, uh, you know, retiring tomorrow. And then you've also pledged that deferred compensation and that teacher who's going to retire 30 years from now and is just starting out their retirement. Um, you know, those are really significant funds that are taking into account these risks and need the information that um, can help them make smart management decisions. Um, and so I, as I those risks- an analogy here, if you could tell me if it's accurate. Um, hmm. When we're talking about something that is less than voluntary, let's say an SEC rule or regulation of some sort, what you're really talking about here is accurate labeling for the consumers uh, so that you know risks are fully disclosed so that people in the marketplace can make intelligent uh, and informed choices in the marketplace and not be misled that things are accurate. So for instance, if you buy a laundry detergent and it has a and it has some hazardous chemical in it, it, you know, it may be required that you disclose that to the consumer before they buy it. Or mm -hmm. if, for instance, uh, you know, there were child slave labor used in the manufacture of some product, that might be need, be required to be disclosed so that the consumer can can be can be informed about what's going on with the manufacturer of that product. Is that an accurate analogy? That that is accurate. And like, you know, these climate related risk disclosures, this disclosure pathway, it is really right now at the point where we're trying to get decision makers the information that they need to make an informed decision so that they can minimize the risk that is held within the portfolio that they're stewarding on behalf of retirees, on behalf of those that have entrusted those funds to them. Yeah. So this is this is something that the, that we've been doing in the marketplace for, for uh, over a century now, ma making sure that labeling is accurate, that disclosures are made to, to consumers so that they can make correct free market choices and, and not be misled or have have uh, vital information withheld from them in making their decisions as to how to direct their money in the free market. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And, you know, I think what we've seen in doing so and in moving that daylighting and in moving towards requiring that disclosure is that the idea that that information is so powerful that there has been a huge backlash that has been sparked that um, are these exact policy fights that Sarah and I have been um, following um, for the last number of years. And so this backlash is in deep response to the power of that information that investors and consumers need to be able to make good decisions. Um, any Any questions from... Just to pause there, I know that was kind of a lot of. No, I think that, that's that's pretty clear. That what uh, what the, the there's a call, there's a demand uh, for these policies and for disclosure of this information in the marketplace, and the the marketplace is responding 
And sometimes when government decides to step in, they, they do so in order to protect the fairness of the marketplace and the accuracy of the information being provided to consumers and, and other participants in the market. Yep. And so that daylighting, oh, yes, George? Oh, Hi. Yeah, no, it, it's George Beverly. I'm the secretary for the for DEG. Thank you for coming on. I, I do have questions. First, I'll make a comment and then I'll then I'll ask you a question. When we're we're talking about these areas um, that you were referring to according to your slide, in in people of uh, BIPOC communities, we have known these things for years. So it is not until it has been brought to light that it's all of a sudden a big deal. Being woke, as the Republicans call it, we've we've known about all these type of things. If you go back, actually go back to redlining, or if you go back to after World War II and talk about why Social Security was made or why the VA housing was made, but Blacks couldn't was not a, afforded these things. So for for me and people of color, th this is nothing new. So when they when they go and talk about um, uh, these stakeholders coming into our communities, what is good for them, but they never give us the information. So we can never, as a community, learn and grow from it. So, for example, um, the government took away all of the low-income housing around the country, which is great. Where did they move them to? Move them to? What what it came of, of 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 the communities that was there? Did they replace anything for those individuals who were in the low income in house uh, in low income housing abilities to move into the upper echelons in their um, uh, social status and economic status? And I mean, but um, the question I do have is is can you talk more about the climate and um, economic movements in? BIPOC communities? Sarah, I saw you come off mute. You want to answer? Or... Uh, sure. So okay. um, are you, and I, and this is more of a clarifying. Um, so George, are you wanting us to talk a little bit more about these things and how it impacts the BIPOC um, communities? Or um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Cor correct. correct. Okay. So um, Okay, well, I will tell Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so earlier um, last year, I forgot the name of it, but it was a big deal where there was a little town outside of of, of Phoenix. Um, it was an all black community. Um, well, not completely all black now, but uh, the they were trying to put a wind turbine in their community, and you know, just trying to move them out. So I've I've only been here for three years, so trying to understand that type of movement by and um, these stakeholders, as you, as as they are called, um, and the people who want to do to build in these communities and remove people in social or economic um, lower echelons, how can how can you talk directly to the the, the um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and I also throw in um, access because that's what we're talking really talking about. So, well, I, I will say. Um, so so I'm a I'm a Latina. I'm my family is immigrants came from from Guatemala. Um, you know, and so I, I I think it's so important, and this is where DEI um and all these play such a key role in um in the industry and in, in, in corporations and and not just corporations. I think across the sector. So like in government, um, because government employs a lot of employees, and we do make does it have decision making in terms of funding, property tax collections, where we're investing our resources, right? Um, and so when you start to take away, and the fact that they're coming after DEI, that's concerning, um, because they don't want us to have the conversations. They don't want to have it where a company is including DEI in their analysis of, you know, where are we? And so I'll tell you from my perspective, right? It is important for me to be able to look at ESG and DEI and the decisions I make because I want to invest my ta the taxpayer dollars in a company that is not just that is truly doing good because of a long-term 
you know, they're going to be around for a long time. You know, we as BIPOC, we are a growing population. We are obviously getting seats at the table that we didn't have even five, 10 years ago. And so to ignore us and to not include that in, you know, their policies, in their decisions, Decision making means that, in my opinion, they're not going to be around in the next 5, 10, 15 years. You can't ignore it. And so in that sense, I think by the fact that they're trying to ignore us is very telling. And you could see how that played out in Florida. And I'm going to say Florida because Florida passed the um, anti-DEI law, DE law that is going through the legislature right now. Um and that, for example, um, I think one of the universities just let go, like their 12, 15 person um, DEI staff, which again is now, you don't have, have any DEI. And when I talk about DEI, it is everything from essentially having a conversation and talking about, um, you know, it isn't just race, ethnicity, it is gender pronouns. I mean, if you look at the actual legislation that's going through, it is literally everything. Um, and so, and of course, it harms the BIPAC community. Um, and so when we talk about these policies, what it's also doing is it's forcing those considerations as they move forward in a company to consider DEI, not just necessarily about um you know, what's a workforce, but it's, you know, what's the makeup of our corporate boards? What is the makeup of, you know, if we're going into a new community, how are we actually addressing it? Are we, for example, displacing, um, you know, our, our lower income communities and then essentially saying, tough luck, you're on your own. We're going to build this beautiful new facility here um, because it was cheap land and now you have nowhere to go. So again, it's those kinds of things that when you are talking about it and you are seeing companies starting to adopt these policies and moving that needle, it really is going to shape the future. But the problem is in Arizona, they are active and not just Arizona. I'm saying Arizona because we're here right now, but across the country, you're seeing them attack it. And so DEI is an easy, unfortunately for them now has become the new attack. Um, but it all falls under this ESG thing because they don't want us to consider, they don't want us to consider environmental justice, right? And how it impacts, you know, climate issues disproportionately impact BIPOC and lower communities of lower income communities, right? They don't want us to have those conversations. So sorry, I went on for a bit here, but I really do um, appreciate that you said that. And we'll keep talking a little bit more as we go through. Um, and I will we'll move through quickly because um, I know there's a lot of questions. So And I'll also just add that like nationally, as this anti-ESG kind of big jumble of topics has been glommed together, the right wing has really, really, it, it began with anti-wokeness came from like a deep sense of anti-blackness and that, you know, traces back to their policy positions for a very, very long time. And it really builds on that. This is a new flavor of a very, very old story. Yeah. And it's one that they've really been leaning into with these DEI attacks and expanding, you know, beyond kind of the financial ramifications and the corporate decisions that, you know, Sarah and I have focused on into what Institute of Higher Education and what can be taught in schools and all of, they're all related. And they're really leaning into the DEI and the race baiting in this conversation because that's how they get their base to pay attention to this area. Mm -hmm. Um as it's part of this, um, you know, bigger umbrella. And so it's really been one of the starting impulses and a really, really key part of kind of recognizing where this this fight has like come from and what it is building upon, mm -hmm. uh, which is a far, far dates it. Um, to kind of get into that pushback. So we had both voluntary action, we had action that was beginning to trigger regulation to basically make that good data, transparent data. And this backlash started about three years ago with model legislation that was coming up through the states, actions by attorneys generals um, and Republican state treasurers who were using the powers of their person, their um, powers, 
all to support um, this suite of anti-ESG policies. And then in the last year, we've really seen this um, increase on the national stage where we saw it in presidential posturing around like Vivek Ramaswamy's presidential campaign. Ron DeSantis was running on this as a key part of his platform before he, uh, you know, crashed and died. In the race. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the great news is that like none of the candidates that ran on this have done well. The bad news is that we're seeing Trump begin to pick up on it. And we also know that it's baked into the Project 2025 vision for what a future national Republican administration is going to be putting forward um, are the suite of policies that are attacking ESG, are attacking DEI, and really trying to constrain the freedoms that we have within the current economy and the information that we have available to us to make good economic decisions. Yeah. At, at it, that point, let me just interject real, real quickly. The current status of, of the, the legal thinking around these anti-DEI, anti-ESG pro- policies, uh, the 11th Court of uh, the, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit just recently held, upheld an injunction against the enforcement of the Florida legislation, uh, say, saying basically that uh, uh, that law, which basically tried to restrict employees or prohibit employers from requiring employees to attend training sessions or other activities that espouse or promote it, concepts related to race, color, sex, national origin, uh, in a unanimous decision of the 11th Circuit in Honey Fund Incorporated versus Governor of the State of Florida, uh, they held that the Florida statute draws, quote, distinctions based on viewpoint, the most pernicious forms of dividing lines under the First Amendment and cannot be sustained as an attempt to control speech by recharacterizing it as conduct. Uh, it's very important to, to to note here that what they're saying is that this runs afoul very, very deeply and fundamentally against our First Amendment rights as Americans. Uh, so I just want to get us up to date, up to speed on the the, the latest legal status of some of these attacks. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. I yeah, really, really appreciate that in the tie to, you know, freedom of speech. A lot of these policies have include, included compelled speech where you know, there's there's bills where folks are being required to disclose things that may not be true and that they don't believe. Um, and so we're really at a point where, um, you know, some of some of those disclosure ask are just harming the freedoms that are bound in that constitution of ours. Um, this isn't happening organically. And I think that's like one of the most important pieces in my mind to understand is there's a group of organizations, many of which you will be likely familiar with, like ALEC, perhaps, which is the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Heritage Foundation, the Republican Attorney General's Association, um, Consumers Research, which is a little bit newer on the scene uh, in this iteration, at least, but very focused on drawing attention to this anti-ESG fight, and then the SFOF, which is organizing Republican treasurers. And this constellation of organizations has been uh, involved in a long history of deregulation of uh, going up against uh, workplace protections and labor and going up against climate action. And if we look at the funders of these organizations um, and the folks that are providing, you know, a lot of resources to these organizations to bring this conversation and fight to where we're having it today, um, those include folks like Leo Leonard, who is the man who ran the Federalist Society and got us our current Supreme Court. Um, It includes uh, a number of organizations that are related to the Koch Brothers Network, which has funded climate denial um, for many, many years. And so this constellation of organizations are also largely national out-of-state organizations funded by a very um, tight community of major donors that are coming in from out-of-state to um, tell folks how they should be governing um, their constituents. And so it's like really looking at, um, you know, a small assortment of like billionaires who are closely associated with the protected and preferred industries that these laws are protecting. So I think, you know, fossil fuels as the clean energy transition has um, made their business uh, harder to access capital. Um, And we're looking at clean energy um, as opposed to, fossil energy. Um, I think about the 
you know, pledges after Sandy Hook and Parkland that the major banks made to um, cut ties and financing for weapons and bullet manufacturers. Those are also protected by these laws, um, basically saying that those banks cannot have that as a policy um, preference and still contract with the state. And so we look at these like protectionist measures that are really cutting into the economic freedom that the market has um, in order to deliver on what customers and their investors want. Um, and it's it's coming from a very, very small group of out-of-state interest. Um, and the ways that this um, is showing up in those specific targets include, as I said, climate risk and opportunities. Um, you know, right now, the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, a really historic um, piece of legislation that provides support for clean energy deployment. And many and most of those dollars are tied to not just getting dollars out the door for clean energy, but really tied to having support for projects that have been developed hand in hand with communities and have community benefits associated with it. And so partnerships between, um, you know, the new energy economy and the um, folks and places who will benefit um, to define what those benefits can and should be really designed from a policy perspective to um, fix some of the economic um, ills of the old economy that kind of you know, set up fence line communities and polluted neighborhoods without asking permission. Um, mm -hmm. And so still imperfect, and there's a lot of work to do to support that deployment, but the bones are in there and the administration is thinking deeply about how to, through their programs, really um, help those clean energy investments unlock economic opportunity, um, particularly for communities that have been um, left out of the economic um, you know, upside of the fossil economy that we've had. There's also increasing risk from climate fuel disasters. Um, and we also have, um, you know, pro-climate policies that are gaining momentum. And so all of these are factors that investors um, should be taking into account. Um, and they're ones that the state and these policies are asking us to not take into account um, and are trying to stop uh, investors and money managers from being able to consider. Um, DEI, um, we've you know talked about this as well. There's um, specific legislation right now to outlaw DEI programs in government. Um, this, uh, you know, a version of this bill has been hit in dozens of states. Um, in Missouri last year, there was complete uproar when a DEI ban with public monies came in because as, um, you know, Tucson Senator says, these are concepts that, you know, within the business world have really shown to promote interest and the bottom line and also carry us into a more equitable, uh, economy that we're trying trying hard to build. Yeah. Can um, I just and then something real quick here, uh, in response to, to what George said, um, I think it's important to, to highlight that, uh, a lot of the harmful externalities of, uh, parts of our past in turn, especially in terms of fossil fuels, uh, was the concerted effort, uh, of those corporations promoting those fossil fuel industries to hide the effect of externalities, uh, the impact of the the negative impact of those externalities of those industries, uh, by shutting them shunting them across to people who are less economically powerful, people who have less access to government, less access to media, less access to you know remediation for the harms those externalities such as pollution uh, causes communities, and that's one of the things that George was pointing out. I think was that. Uh, BIPOC communities, by and large, have have been uh, disproportionately impacted by those externalities, such as you know the violence associated with with firearms, the the pollution associated with with uh, our fossil fuel industries, uh, and that has been purposeful. It has been it has been uh, it has been a conscious choice, and that by adopting DEI and ESG, one of the things we can do. Uh, help do is to surface where those er externalities are harming our our minority communities, and I think that's important to to highlight. Uh, so thanks, George, for that question. 
I just can I make a, a quick comment? Yeah, so, please. Um, so I lived in Oregon before I moved here. I lived um, in Blue River. It's a small community of 900. I was the only black man in the in the community, but we're close, 45 minutes outside of Eugene. And so I joined a. I was I was co chair of the uh, DEI advisory committee to this for the city. And so we were making sure um, that the that the city employees were getting training, ethnical training about certain things. And I had a I had an appointment with uh, the sheriff and and the police department, and they were mandatory to spend. I, I don't know how many I forgot how many hours, but they're supposed to spend so many hours. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry to, to giggle because. Instead of doing the training, they were able to um, go to um, African American functions and and check it off their list, saying they were part they were doing DEI work. That has nothing to do with DEI work. The, you showing up and be getting an award does not reflect understanding the community in which you serve. So if you as a police officer have never been a, around black people, a lot of black people in one time, and you only see stereotypes of how black people are, and you are a police officer, you go in with that idea, ideology into that neighborhood. So for me, it's, it's really um, disheartening to hear this kind of rhetoric because, and I know it's not you guys, but it's just nationwide, but the yeah. rhetoric the rhetoric of DEI is not needed because we're all we're all human beings, but we're black people are not treated as human beings. They're still calling Barack Obama and Michelle Obama monkeys. We're yeah. still animals. So how can we all be equal? But but then say we don't need to know our history. We don't need black people don't need to know their history. White people don't need to know their history. And all, and you know it, it, it's just yeah. mind blowing to hear that. That's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a there's a lot of a crossover with how we teach uh, in our schools and attacks on on sen and censorship in our schools of our history and our past and and the true racial history of the United States uh, intersecting with a lot of these anti ESG and anti DEI campaigns. Yeah, that's a good point, George. Thank you, um, George. I just want to say I appreciate you bringing that up, but I, I do have to say, in kind of living breathing this for the last couple years, like in the trenches, there is an undertone of what they're truly getting at is it's, it's racism. And it's it's a very, it's these anti-ESG, anti-DEI, they don't want companies to truly address these issues that have been ingrained for centuries, right? They don't want that needle to move. And this is how they're doing it. And they're putting a new buzzword on it, but let's just call it but what it is, is they don't want BIPOC communities to move forward. They don't want, you know, climate things to really move forward because they know it's going to help us. And so that's why, too, for me, it's very passionate about, you know, at the end of the day, who is being harmed the most from me have always been harmed the most. It, it, and so, you know, it really upsets sets me I am so there with you and it is so frustrating that I'm like why am I fighting for us to just even begin the conversation yeah. like that is what we're trying to do is like we are fighting to keep the conversation moving because they don't they want to stop and go back to everyone is like you said everyone is people we should love one no no and um I will oh I will let Francis speak yeah, just like seconding everything Sarah just said and like really appreciate that. The um because the other thing that I think's wild is like you look at the actions that companies are taking on DEI, on climate, it is baby steps. It is the babiest of baby steps. They're they're like just cracking the door on what needs to happen. And just cracking that door has provoked this backlash. And so it's like, how do we keep clear eyed about like where we need to go, which isn't back to the status quo of like where we were two years ago before this backlash started, but how do we drive forward and like think about the policies and the power that we need to make a truly inclusive economy across the board, like flat out. To finish the call out buckets.
gun safety, we talked about this one. And I think, you know, Sarah, I'm going to maybe close the slides so we can just move to conversation. But where are these things showing yeah. up in Arizona in the elections this year? This stuff is on the ballot, as with so many other things. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about like what you're seeing in the legislature right now. Yeah. And so where are we going? And we, and we can probably share the slides. Yeah, we to go up to slide. Okay, I'm gonna it's with you. Um, Mike. Oh no, 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 no. I mean, we could share the the information with Mike. Um, oh, to hand out. But you know, there are a number of bills that are going through. The um, this, the this specific. Video. Sorry, I think you have a little bit oh. of lag, Sarah. We sometimes okay. talk over each other. Um, the specific. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there it is. That's thank you. Um, yeah, Francis. Uh, so I, I wanted to put this together. So you know what's going on in Arizona. So total of 15 anti ESG bills have been introduced this session Four concurrent resolutions, which means if they pass both chambers, they go on the ballot. Yeah. And that is really key because now we're talking about no campaigns. And this is only the beginning because if they are successful with one, these 15, we're going to start seeing all of those be concurrent resolutions. Yeah. That's alarming. Um, so two of those four have already swapped. Um, one of them is uh, anti-firearm or it's a firearm discrimination bill, mm -hmm. which means governments can't do business with history. Um, and then the other one is a very extreme bill, which says governments can't promote, be part of organizations that, and they list a bunch of stuff, but they are literally, one of the things is Marxist ideologies. So um, you promote alternative forms of transportation that's not cars, can't be a part of that. Um, you know, anything like that. So that is a huge one too, because that is encompassing everything. Like, and who gets to determine that? Anyone, like anyone could file a complaint. If I'm doing DEI work, they can say that's a Marxist ideology. They can then file a complaint. Then governments have to pay fees. We can't be a part of it. And then it's, it's just, it's a mess. So that is also going through quickly. Um, and so making that aware, um, there's one specifically that is just DEI, that's um, the SB1005. Um, that one <clears throat> prohibits governments from having any sort of DEI training programs, policies, staff, but it also says governments can't do business with any company that has a DEI policy. That's so nice. that's kind of what they're... That's nuts, right? So is that really what we want our taxpayer money to go to? So I listed them all there. Um, the When I say the two concurrent ones, those actually, um, they introduce them in both chambers. And so and one's hopped over, one hasn't, et cetera, but they're moving, unfortunately, on party lines. Um, so just really putting that out there. And what's, again, we've seen it across the country. They've introduced legislation because we have Governor Hobbs who has been vetoing them, they're now going down this ballot resolution path. And so if these, like I mentioned, this is only the beginning and we're gonna have a packed ballot. It's, it's gonna impact. It's going to make it where we can invest taxpayer monies the way that we can't move the needle. We can't have the conversations we can't address fundamentally what the issues are. And then it's gonna pretty much, let's be real here. I mean, are companies gonna react or are they gonna walk away? And we're seeing them walk away in other states. So who's impacted again? Um, it's it's our BIPOC communities, it's our low income individuals. It, it's, it's going to have major ramifications. And so this is a, a big slide for us in Arizona. Um, and then it also ripples into your races. So, you know, you've got a state treasurer um, who is Republican, who is super anti-ESG, anti all of us. I mean, you know, she's adopted an anti-ESG policy um, for their investment. So that means that um, your pension money, um, taxpayer money, pension money, everything, you can't 
can't consider these kinds of things. They're not even considered a risk analysis. Um, and so she is on the forefront of this. She's part of one of those organizations. Um, and so again, elections, obviously we know in this group, elections matter. And this is what happened when um, you have a, and elect those who don't want to address the problems. Um, and so, uh, and you... then Corporation Commission. Sorry. Uh, yeah, again, the leg. Uh, I'm wondering, did Treasury Sorry. actually campaign on these issues of anti-ESG, anti-DEI? A little bit. So this was kind of, I, so I will tell you, um, we knew those of us who were very, like in the treasury world, we knew that she was, but she was very publicly a bit neutral on it. And then this, and it came out a little bit during the race. I know Martin Katsada really tried to talk about it. It came out once a little bit during the debate, but it really flew under the radar. And now she has been very vocal. Hoffman, um, Jake Hoffman, and one of some of these DEI thing, or ESG DEI bills has said, oh no, um, Treasury Yee and I have been working on these for years. So you can kind of tell she's obviously eyeing a higher office and it's just coming out, um, you know, Pull out where she stands on these. So um, that's one to just keep in mind. And then you're starting to see it pop out um, in the corporation and commission races. So that's a big one coming up. Um, you are starting to see on the Republican side um, that this whole, you know, um, again, when you see ESG, you need to remember that that's probably including DEI. Um, so don't let those acronyms confuse you. Um, they're not, I, you know, when someone asks, well, do you include them? I'm like, yes, because that's what they're doing. Um, when they say things like Marxist ideologies, they're including it all. Um, and so that's something to take note of is that you're going to start seeing that in the corporation commission race. You are seeing it, um, you know, as recently as a month ago. And so that's something to, um, keep in mind. Um, and, you know, and I think um, one of the candidates on the Republican side um, is a uh, Black mom who is spewing this kind of rhetoric. So it is, you know, again, really need to pay attention to this because it's impacting up and down the, literally up and down the ballot at every level. And for instance, yeah, I, um, just, I don't uh, know if you wanted to add to that piece. Yeah, if I could just interject oh, ahead. real quick here on the Arizona Corporation Commission in particular, it seems to me that pushing to ban ESG at utilities is really putting a finger on the scale for fossil fuel energy. Uh, because, you know, I don't, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but Arizona Corporation Commission is supposed to be protecting consumers and letting consumers uh, make decisions such as we want clean energy. Not only that, but clean energy, uh, wind and solar are now not only competitive with fossil fuels, they're cheaper than fossil fuels. And so by pushing this, they're in fact harming consumers by forcing them to continue to use generation technologies that no longer are cost effective. So I just wanted to interject that real quick. Uh, Francis, on to you. Yeah, re really, really spot on. And the Corporation Commission, really wonky name, but you know, it is, it, it has direct power over what your household bills are every single month. They're the ones who, when APS wants to do a rate hike, they're the ones who say yes or no. They're the ones who are looking at what energy investments are able to go forward. And they're saying no to pollution or they're saying yes to pollution. They're looking at air quality. They're looking at the cost of new energy versus uh, old energy. And they have um, recently also taken action to do away with some of the um, coolest consumer programs that are promoting things like energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, in the last, uh, I think, three weeks, the commission moved to basically um, do away with their energy efficiency programs, which was helping to weatherize homes and provide resources to households to um, basically create that tighter envelope so you're not paying as much for AC in the summer um, and you're able to have more efficient appliances. And they've got, they've done away with that um, while also blocking clean energy deployment um, as those costs have dropped. And so it's really, this is, I think, one of the most important races for pocketbooks. Um, there's three seats that are up this year. 
Um, and we and, do have three candidates. And three we have three candidates. Running, yes. yes, which is super exciting. And and at least one of them needs to get over the finish line if we have a chance of getting a pro-consumer, pro-clean energy uh, board majority by the end of this decade. So it's, it's really, clear, really, Three of those seats are up and Democrats can vote for all three of them. And we can take the Arizona Corporation Com Commission. We can take control of the Arizona Corporation Commission in this race in November of 24 uh, by voting for all three of those candidates and taking those three seats. Absolutely. Um, so well, that I just one. Wanna... And then la last thought on like Kimberly Yi, you know, looking to, you know, she didn't campaign very hard on this. She's taken at least 13 different public letter stances on this along with her uh, other state treasurer colleagues um, on the Republican side. She's joined into 13 of the national actions that have been trying to uh, control and ban certain types of investment information. Um, and so it's very clearly in her policy suite and lane what she's been um, pushing forward on the on this front, even if she's um, didn't talk about it on the campaign trail. She's been an active member of the mm -hmm. SFOF and uh, very, very key member of that what are, what are those of Republican treasurers. SFOF, you, you mentioned? Uh, the State Financial Officers Foundation, which is the group of, it's basically the organization that is uh, organizing the Republican treasurers around anti-ESG and around anti-DEI. And they're signing coalition letters, they're networking with each other, they're schmoozing and really figuring out how to um, bring these policies to their management of state funds. Yeah. Sarah, you had something you wanted to interject? I was just going to say, you know, um, you know, in short, like, you can't talk about DEI without talking about ESG because it is a component of it. And so when you see all those attacks, it is everything. And fundamentally, though, at the end of the day, and George brought it up perfectly, it's it's impacting our BIPOC communities. And that's really what we need to remember. And as we approach these things, as we talk about them, it's, you know, we need to obviously talk about we need to move the needle more, like, you know, stop taking these baby steps and really move forward. But in like a state like Arizona, we also need to make sure that we can can continue to see that move forward. Um, and that means taking stances, being educated, especially as the ballot's gonna come. Um, you know, because again, like, I mean, you even brought, I think it was you, George, who brought it up, or maybe um, you, Michael, of just, you know, you talk about gun violence, who's disproportionately impacted by gun violence, right? And so, I mean, every piece of this, we know what is fundamentally at the end of it. and. We need to address it. And this is about fairness. This is about equity. We need to address this. We need to fix things. And so, you know, call it, you got to call it what it is. And I said it earlier, you know, this is pure racism and that's what they're doing. And they're trying to mask it as something else. And it's not, um, it's what it's always been about with them. And and most importantly, it's a, it's an attack on our fundamental rights to free speech and free association. So you know, here in the United States, we've always operated yeah. under a, a principle of free speech, free markets, free people. Uh, and these attacks mm -hmm. directly impinge upon our First Amendment rights as Americans to us to choose to associate or not associate yep. with who we want to, to talk and organize and speak and act in concert together uh, in order to achieve political goals. And these attacks on DEI and ESG are specifically and centrally and have been held by courts and will continue to be held by courts as direct attacks on our First Amendment rights as Americans. Mm -hmm. And so I want people to, to, to take that in, to, to internalize that fact that they're not just saying, oh, don't be woke. They're not saying, oh, don't you know, discriminate against these, these companies. They're saying you don't have a right to make things better in your community, for your companies, for your coworkers, for the, you know, for your consumers, you know, for your constituents. You don't have the right to do things we don't like. And that's fundamentally 
un-American and just anti-constitutional. Uh, they claim this mantle of the Constitution when it's, mm -hmm. you know, they by their actions and by the, the laws they're trying to pass and the policies they're trying to promote, they're clearly demonstrating they're fundamentally against what makes America great. Agreed. You know, like I said, you can't say you're, in, you're for a free market when you're clearly doing the opposite. Exactly. And they love to say that they're, 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 you know, everything what they truly are not standing for. George, I think you, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I just want to say this to, to my, my white allies, brothers and sisters that are on this call. Um, this is such a important um conversation and when we talk about the dei movement in no way are we talking uh, uh, we're talking about the bipoc community uh, which stands for uh um, black and indigenous people of color um when we say that we need more progress or we need more access having one black person or having one hispanic person uh, or one latino in the room uh, one Asian person in the room is not diversity. That's that's just one person. If you have a boardroom and there's only one black person, a woman, and the rest are white males, that's not diversity. Nope. That, that's still the same status quo. Yeah, it's tokenism. Right, completely. Um, I wasn't gonna go go there. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Yeah. But I was. Gonna, but, but 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 what I'm saying <laughs> is 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 that even white liberals. Who think who believe, and I'm not, I shouldn't say think, they believe that they are on the side of of uh, of people of color. Sometimes you get caught up in the systematic things that are said in the wokeism of what the Republicans are saying. For example, when we talk about white privilege, white privilege in, in my definition is having access to things that white people don't have. I can't go into um, uh, an influential, influential neighborhood without being um, asked, why am I here? Or what are you doing in the store? Do you have enough money to be there? It, it, those are the type of things that happens to people of color, even if I'm wearing expensive things. You see it all the time. So simply what I'm saying is, is that when we talk about this issue, we have to leave our egos at the door and just listen. Because when we go into white white um, areas, we don't we're not ourselves because we can't be ourselves. Just as Mr. Mike articulately said, we we have to present ourselves differently. And if we have to present ourselves differently, are we really being Americans? Because we should be all Americans, but we get questioned. And that's that's just my little comment. But this is such a great uh, great conversation. So thank you. Uh, if I could address that real quick, I'd just like to point out that, you know, part of DEI training uh, that is provided by a lot of organizations is is to try and address some of those unconscious biases uh, that people have in their interactions with the public, with their coworkers, uh, with consumers uh, that, you know, that are not necessarily surfaced and people may not be aware of consciously having these biases and the and 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 their, their reactions to, to people in the BIPOC, BIPOC community and their interactions with them can be poisoned by that without them being conscious of it. And part of DEI training, uh, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is to try and surface some of those attitudes so that can be, people can be more aware of what they're doing. So uh, that, that's where uh, either Sarah or Francis, do you, do you agree with that? Is that, am I being accurate? Yeah. No, you are. That that's part of the training. Um, you know, and that's really where even when we talk about DEI, like you said, George, it is more than just having one BIPOC person on a board. It's having more than just one person in leadership. It's, you know, also having the trainings on, you know, um everything that you just talked about, um, and conscious bias, um bias and stuff like that. So like that is part of truly like what 
DEI is moving and truly is, it isn't just tokenism. And so that is truly a, a thing to clearly um, work towards is, is truly that, like true DEI, true training, um, you know, versus just, you know, yeah, tokenism. And so that is part of what you're seeing in terms of um, companies doing trainings on, you're seeing it embedded into government. Um, and so again, we need to keep that needle moving. Like we, we really need to keep it going because it's got a ways to go. Um, and so we don't want to just slam the door shut. Um, we need to prop it open. We're going the wrong direction with, um, and that's just what the Republicans want. Can I play a uh, devil's advocate here and have you respond uh, to, sure. I guess, the a talking point that might be used by Republicans or or people who have been uncomfortable uh, with DEI training is that they will say, well, it's an indoctrination. Or you're trying to indoctrinate me into a certain uh, philosophy or a certain way of seeing the world. Um, how, how do you respond to, to people who, who claim, you know, woke indoctrination uh, as a pushback or an argument against ESG policies and programs? It's a great question. Um, I'll say there's some you might not be able to change their mind. <laughs> I've definitely seen that. Um, but, you know, truly what it's doing is it is making them aware of one, like true history, like what's truly happened. Two, it's making them aware, like you don't recognize the BIPOC community as having skill sets to be in certain rooms. And two, it's, it's truly giving us a voice that we deserve but at the same time it's like look you want me to look at things from your viewpoint put myself in your shoes we're asking you to do the same we're asking you to take a step back and see how do you think this has truly impacted um someone in the BIPOC community you know, we're, we're, we're asking you to also treat us humanely we're asking you to treat us and give us the same rights that you fight for. I deserve those same rights because I don't get them. And so again, it's one of those where it's like, we're not doing indoctrination. We are tr asking you to put yourself in our shoes and help us be able to fight for our civil rights, help us to fight for our, you know, what we come, my, my family came here for the American dream, better future. I mean, you know, my family in Guatemala is still bathed with buckets, right? So I just, deserve to be treated like a human being like you treat a white male colleague that's what i'm asking you to look at and to understand that there is by you know you do have this unconscious bias opinion we're asking you to recognize and to really learn more about how other people experience the world yeah uh Francis the same thing you know when you you hear them sorry Sorry, go ahead, Mike. I, it's the lag. Yeah, it's the lag. So Francis, <laughs> say I'm I'm a CEO of a corporation that you're advising. Uh, and I come up to you and I say, well, I don't really want to participate in this DEI stuff. I think it's indoctrination. I think it's woke. I think it's it's terrible. It's the the Marxist trying to tell me how to run my business. What would you say to a to a person like that uh, in order to to make them realize that it's in their benefit and in their interest to come on side? Yeah. Well, I think I'd I'd ask them to look at who their customers are, who their investors are, and look at the deep, deep uh, trends within the economy and within inclusion of the economy and say like, look, America is getting far, far more diverse. And what is your plan to have a functional business model if you aren't recognizing that? And where are you going to find talent if you're ta shrinking your talent pool artificially before you even begin by not looking at the breadth of folks who could add value to your company um, as your employees and could buy your products and become champions of your products? And so if you're not taking this seriously, um, what is your plan to stay in business? over the long term. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a question from Demetra. Uh, I will add her to the spotlight. Hi, Demetra. Hi. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I couldn't join the conversation earlier, which I'm very sad about because I have a feeling there's some really interesting and important things being said here. Well, you can review the like recording. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have this up on the, the YouTube channel. Okay. 
Um, so I now have some very extensive experience as a DI manager in an organization. Uh, and um, one of the things that I found is that um, there was a huge, and, and I'm sorry, I apologize if you've already gone through all of this. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. Just, yeah, forgive me. This is a point I'm sure you've talked about, but the organization I was working for was extremely interested in training in part because it was a compliance issue. If they had employee relations related issues and they had an employee who wasn't behaving well, they could say, well, but you did your DEI training. And if you're still messing up, then it's your fault. We're not responsible. Um, the DEI training seemed to be the, 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 the ultimate solution for a lot of things. Institutional change, for instance, looking at the data, who are we employing and which positions where? What does pay equity look like in our organization? Uh, how do we deal with conflict in the organization on a day-to-day -day basis, not just in training? All of that was a lot more difficult to get to. Um, there was a lot more hesitancy to take up that kind of thing. Um, and on the issue of what do you say to the corporation that thinks, you know, the whole DEI things, indoctrination and woke BS, I mean, there is, in, there is a lot of research out there which says that uh, an inclusive workplace policy is good for a business. It helps widen your talent pool. It diversifies teams. And we know that diverse teams are ultimately more effective than homogenous teams. Uh, you, you know, there's not this group thing going on that can negatively impact the things that people are coming up with. It's great for innovation and younger people, especially because we have a growing pool of BPOC job seekers want to know, are interested in whether or not uh, the organizations they're applying for and working for have inclusive policies. So it, it, it makes sense from a business perspective, not only from a sort of ethical moral perspective, which of course is, the, uh, is important, um, but again, there's just tons of research right now that's, that, that really does the numbers and say it's worth it for corporations generally, not only corporations, but for other organizations as mm -hmm. well, to invest in um, DI and inclusive workplace policies. That's a great comment. Thank you, thank you Demetria. Did you have uh, any uh, questions that uh, you might want the uh, Sarah or Francis to respond to? Yes. I want to say I really appreciate what you just said and shared. I it's like so spot on with both the studies and lived experience of like understanding the value for companies that comes from having good policies around DEI, and it also um, you know is a clear uh, reminder that you know we say DEI like there's one thing that is DEI, and it's like you can go to the store, you can get an Insta DEI button and like it's the same thing implemented everywhere and that's not the case at all as you know like there are some DEI programs that are tokenism and they are designed to check a box and not to really create an institutional culture around um, thinking of inclusivity and there are exceptional programs where it has been really deeply worked into culture to uncover those unconscious biases and really create a, um, you know, robust um, culture around uh, inclusion. And there's a really big gulf between those. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, delta between those two things and not having this be a box checking exercise, but really pointing out that value. Um, and I also think the point about young workers, like, you know, all, all of my peers, it's like, it, it's a baseline question of like culture that you ask when you interview with a company is like, who are my colleagues? How are you treating us? And are you responsive to the diversity that I've grown up with in the world and expect in my workplace? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, my, my question is for uh, Sarah. Um, considering that it's getting very difficult to especially hire young people into government, do you have you run across any ways that you can promote things like DEI 
ESG to attract younger people to to work. I mean, I know Pima County is probably maybe overall maybe about 70% staff that where it should be. So if you have anything you can say about that, help us out. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, that's a great great question. So, you know, I'm very proud of the team we have at our treasurer's office. Um, and so, um, you know, we really incorporate um, truly create, um, we have a dreamer, we have a young gay Latino, um, we have uh, um, uh, Navajo, we have Hopi, um, we have a, a young gay black man. We are extremely diverse in our office and actually have a very young team. Um, and a lot of the stuff we did was actually, um, I really believe in paying, having paid intern directly with, um, you know, the organizations on campus to recruit um, a diverse pool in our uh internship program. So we actually have five paid interns in my office. Um, and actually last year, who's now a uh, staff in our office. Um, and so it's creating those opportunities, but you have to be proactive. Um, um, and you have to obviously create a safe space. Um, and so, and you need to be supportive and you need to provide training and you need to want to elevate and what I say, at least in treasury, I'm like, look, I get it. Finance is not the sexiest topic. We're not elections. Um, we're not, you know, like law enforcement, but you can actually create a lot of change in this office. So um, that's something we've done has really um, been able to recruit that way. So I think really go to where they're at and creating opportunities for to come into government and being very need internship opportunities because if you don't pay them, a lot of your BIPOC, um, you know, students won't be able to participate. That's just unfortunately. So paid government internships, I think is super key. And that helps recruit a younger workforce in the future. So Sarah, I've turned off your video in the hopes of uh, improving the uh, the lag in your in your audio. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we'll see if that Im improves the 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 lag issue. Uh, Brian, did you want to follow up at a, at all on that? Uh, no, no. I was just I I think that's great that she that Sarah does have such a diverse staff. I you know I think that something we could try to achieve here in in Pima County, since we, our staff isn't, well, we're very understaffed in most of our offices, but we're not actively recruiting. And I think I think that's a, a, a good point to make. To go to, we have a university here too. We have the U of A, so we yep. have a good pool to go to, you know, to try to, you know, recruit into government, so. Absolutely. Uh, Francis, I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to interject there too, if you had anything that you wanted to respond to Brian's point. Yeah. And I mean, I think Sarah is actually doing it, but one example I wanted to pull in from Missouri was um, their state government has really struggled with in retention of state employees. Um, they have um, a lot of contention and low funding levels that have made life, you know, working for the Department of Social Service um, uh, a job that folks haven't stayed in um, particularly long. And so to address their retention, they started to kind of look at programs that could help, um, you know, foster longevity and like keep career staff around longer to really grow the carpets capacity. And they had a diversity inclusion belonging group um, that was formed in 2020 and saw that, you um, the participants who joined in that group experienced less than half of the department-wide turnover rate. And so really also seeing it as a catalyst, not just for attracting talent, but also maintaining and keeping talent and growing um, the folks who are working with you already. 
um, as, a, as a key tool. And, you know, Missouri likewise has seen these exact same attacks against those programs and they're now being banned um, within the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I see Demetria has her hand up again. Uh, um, Mr. Mike, questions. there's a question in the comment uh, in the comments. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, so Kathleen Dodd said, uh, stated, she said, "In this country, everything is about racism." That, that was a, a statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems often that is the that seems to be the case. I mean, yeah, we've we've had a long and storied history of uh, of racism, and you know, largely. The history of America is the history of, over, of trying to overcome it. Uh, Demetria, why don't you unmute and uh, and make your comment or ask your question? Um, one of the things that I think makes the uh, discussion, the sort of broader discussion about EEI and the public debate here in the United States is that much of the intention is focused on race-related issues. Um, which I think is important. I mean, it's, it's a really uncomfortable conversation to have in most places, avoid them. But if you only make it about race, um, people then tend to forget that this is also about other aspects of inclusion. So we're talking about people with different abilities, um, religions, uh, gender identities, and so on. And part of that gets lost at times uh, in the broader discussion. So somebody who's white could say, oh, the whole DI thinks about giving un, you know, black folks who don't deserve their positions jobs. Um, that they themselves, however, one day might develop a disability and be glad to have a DEI person around who's also willing to represent their interests is something that people generally don't think about. It is also about race and should also be about race, but not only, and all of that other stuff gets lost in public debate. And I think we, um, in our discussions, we need to be more strategic about having a more inclusive debate around uh, DEI and all the various aspects that it addresses. That's the one thing. The other thing is that I think Pima County is, um, it is fairly diverse. It's probably, it's not doing that badly as far as its, you know, diversity score generally is concerned. Mm, it does make sense though, to look at the leadership, for instance, at Pima County. I mean, I don't know, that, that gets, that's also a little somewhat uncomfortable. People don't like to look at, again, data and how well represented are groups vertically throughout an organization. Mm. Um, definitely something worth looking at. You need that leadership that's also willing to, um, you know, advocate for strong DI policies. And if they are not, you know, if those people aren't in leadership positions, that makes it complicated. Um, and the, and the last thing I wanted to say is that I don't, getting people in the door is one thing, keeping them is another thing. Somebody said something about retention. The important thing about that though, is that, um, you know, for instance, BPOC and other employees are also ambassadors who can, you know, reach out, mobilize and help recruit if they feel good about their organization, they'll pass the word on to others. Uh, but if they're not feeling great about the organization, they're probably not gonna be uh, you know, very helpful in that respect. But I think keeping in mind that um, having people in the organization is a good sign that others are welcome and be, again, that they are likely to support your efforts to reach out to others um, you know, in this whole diversity context. There are useful useful points. Thank you, Demetria. Did you did uh, Francis or Sarah? Do you have any particular responses to what Demetria said? I just want to say thank you, you Demetria, for for saying that neat and all spot on points. Um, and so, yeah, I I, and I actually am happy that too that you really talked about um, a workforce that's inclusive. And that we are also, um, you know, I don't believe like, for example, in quotas um, in the workforce, because that is obviously meaning that you're going to disproportionately um, favor one group over another. Um, and so that's something, for example, like I say, I will never impose quotas in our office because I don't think that's fair. Um, it's about, you know, every staff member, regardless of, uh, has something to contribute to it. 
team. And so setting quotas means that we are not actually um, utilizing everyone to the best of their abilities. And, you know, maybe you don't process a tax payment fast enough, but guess what? You've never made an error. That's very important to me. Take your time, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that's really important for us to remember in the workplace. Um, and I just truly appreciate everything that you've said. You've hit like some very valid points and some things that we need to also have these conversations. So thank you. Francis, I just wanted to leave some space open for you if you wanted to respond at all. Um, yeah, just tr truly seconding that. And I think particularly the points around a full career pipeline and pathway where it's not just entry level, though it's really important to have that entry level door open um, and thinking through each step of a career as somebody moves from, you know, someone who's taking their first job to developing, you know, that first set of specialized skills to moving into maybe management and then leadership. And like, as somebody comes through that, um, you know, ensuring that that pipeline is open um, at, at all steps and, you know, it has to be addressed each step of the way. All right. Well, uh, unless we have uh, other uh, questions, we're coming up on about an hour and a half here. So, uh, oh, Demetria has got her hand up. Let me pop her back in the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, the... I... Uh... So this is definitely something I'm sure you talked about before I joined. I just wanted to know, um, again, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. I was just wondering why, what, uh, what was, what, um, how did the idea come about to have the event? Mm -hmm. I can, uh, I can address that. Uh, actually, I was, I was speaking with Sarah uh, and, you know, uh, I was very excited about meeting Sarah when I met her. I think a couple of weeks back at uh, a political event here in, in Tucson, I was very impressed uh, by her presentation and uh, I just wanted to, to know her better. And I wanted to, wanted her to do something with DGT because I really was excited to work with her. Uh, and this topic came, came up. She, she raised this topic as something that she really wanted to address that she was concerned about. Uh, and so that was the, the origin of this program. Uh, and I thought, yes, that's something we absolutely need to talk about. It's something that is uh, of growing importance. We're seeing increasing attacks uh, on DEI and ESG programs. Uh, and so I wanted to to have a discussion around this topic. And Sarah was uh, gracious enough to, to facilitate that and to bring Francis on board to, to talk about it. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Great. Thank you. So uh, unless we have any uh, further questions or comments, I'd like to uh, go ahead and uh, turn Sarah's camera back on at the uh, at the possible expense of uh, <laughs> asking her to start her video up at the expense of possibly getting more laggy again. Uh, but I just wanted to give you guys a chance to uh, to have like a, a final say to sort of wrap a bow around the, our discussion and uh, you know maybe give an idea of what people can do in, in their own personal and professional lives in order to, to help uh, advance, uh, you know, the kind of uh, DEI and ESG programs that we've been, we've been talking about in their own lives, in their own communities. So I'll go first, hopefully. There's not too much of a lie. <laughs> Um, so I just want to say really grateful uh, for the space. Thank you. Oh, there's a lag. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm actually in a uh, hotel right now. I'm at a conference. So I'm going to blame the hotel internet. Um, so just again, thank you for the time. Really appreciate it. Love the style of conversation. I hope this continues. And as you look to see, you know, going back to her and I hope you continue to, um, you know, have this, these conversations um, really, again, push the needle so we can truly start to move forward in these areas. Um, and also to keep an eye on, on this because it will be on the ballot. Um, I'm not optimistic we're going to be able to kill it. It's, it's right there at the finish line. So again, great DEI. So really it's just, we 
have to one stop the Republicans who are trying to we need to keep moving forward where we're going and that's something that we can do every day um, whether in our personal lives in our professional lives and then just that little call to action right thanks Sarah yeah you definitely want to get a refund on your on your any wi-fi bill that they're charging you there in that hotel <laughs> thank you Francis um Yes, just like as Sarah said, just truly, truly appreciate y'all for this conversation and for including um, Sarah and I in it. Um, it. Really, really great conversation. And like Arizona is where so many of these policies are rubber hitting the road. And you look at the elections that are coming up. And I think, you know, Sarah said, like keeping laser focused on uh staying ahead of this, stopping the pushback that we're seeing and saying no to the retrenchment of um, these right-wing ideas and then pushing forward and continuing to craft the workplaces, the economy, and the public life that we want. And so really taking that um, in the courses everybody here is already doing. So really, really grateful. Great. I really appreciate your time and your effort in uh, joining us today for this uh, for this discussion. Uh, and uh, I just want to say thanks for everybody who attended. Thanks for everybody who's who's viewing this on, on YouTube afterward. Uh, and I would personally say uh, I would encourage people to maybe consider contacting uh, Ken Bennett, uh, who is a Republican uh, Arizona state senator at this point. But he used to be Arizona state treasurer. Uh, so I think he might, and he, uh, let's be fair, he's still a, he's still a right-wing Republican, but I, I think he's a bit more open-minded uh, to the business sense uh, of using DEI and ESG and our organizations to, to make them more profitable and more uh, functional for everybody. Uh, so I think if there's a key point uh, to, of pressure to bring to bear, I would say, uh, possibly look at Ken Bennett as being that point of pressure that might actually swing one of those Republican senators uh, to say no to advancing this sort of uh, anti-ESG, anti anti-woke, anti-everything anti kind of policy uh, and putting it on our ballot and polluting our ballot thereby uh, and asking people to to vote for hate intolerance and, uh, and a, 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 quite frankly, a suppression of our right to free speech, free association. So with that, I'm going to wrap up for the evening. Thanks again to, to Sarah and Francis for joining us. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for everybody who came and uh, and shared their thoughts and, and ideas with us. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say good evening. Thanks from the DGT. Hey, everybody. It's Senator Mark Kelly. As all of you know, Arizona Democrats have had a lot of important wins over the last few years. We won two U.S. Senate races, and we delivered Arizona's electoral votes to President Biden and Vice President Harris. We elected Governor Katie Hobbs, Secretary of State Adrian Fontes, and Attorney General Chris Mays. Now, those elections were close, and our victories mattered. Arizona Democrats, from the federal to the local level, have delivered real results for our state on critical issues like combating climate change, lowering prescription drug costs, protecting the right to vote, and preventing more restrictions on abortion access. The Democrats of Greater Tucson offers the opportunity to hear from elected officials and candidates about that important work and the issues that matter to them. That information will be invaluable as Arizonans head to the polls. So this election cycle, whether you're signing up to knock doors, make phone calls, or joining the Democrats of Greater Tucson to hear from and speak to Democrats in our area, please know that your voice matters and we need you on this team. Thank you.